an honor uh, to have the privilege of introducing uh, the Reverend Dr. Radita Weems to you. Dr. Weems is an ordained minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She is a graduate of Wellesley College and of Princeton Theological Seminary. She served on the faculty of Vanderbilt Divinity School for a number of years and then also taught for several years at Spelman College before she did one of those midlife things and decided to reinvent her life, <laughs> which she has done in a marvelously creative way and I think courageous way in recent years. She is not only a well-respected biblical scholar, one who, as you have seen, is known for the way in which she can read texts against the grain. She is also an outstanding preacher, um, and Ebony Magazine voted her one of its, the 15 outstanding preachers in the U.S. Um, she, and any of you who were here yesterday and heard that powerful lecture slash sermon <laughs> on David and Jonathan and Saul, and the Jonathan and Saul that is at war often within many of us will not be surprised by that news. <laughs> I first came to know Dr. Weems through her very first book, Just a Sister Away, published now over 20 years ago and recently republished. In that book, she explores the relationships between biblical women such as Sarah and Hagar, Naomi and Ruth, Vashti and Esther, Jephthah's daughter and the women who mourn her death at the hands of her father, and she brings her own womanist perspective to bear in interpreting those texts and encouraging women to build new alliances, new bridges across lines of race and class. Since then, she has published four more books, and in each one of them, one of the things I deeply appreciate about her works is the way she honestly shares her own life pilgrimage and struggles in her works the good, the bad, and the challenging, <laughs> while also inviting us in to wrestle with themes like intimacy or the mentoring relationships of our lives or how do you do ministry when God seems very absent from you. I have also deeply appreciated the encouragement and empowerment Dr. Weems has given to women of faith, especially through her writings and her blog site, if you have not yet paid a visit to somethingwithin.com, somethingwithin.com, I encourage you to do so. For there you will read her latest writings, including the one just posted yesterday that says, help, there's a teenager in my house. <laughs> <laughs> she also posts a wonderful bibliography there for a teacher of preaching I was excited to see of the preaching texts that have informed her own pilgrimage and journey as a preacher and a lecturer. Today, Dr. Wings brings to us her third and final lecture on preaching against the grain, this time focusing on preaching from the underside of the Gospels, Jesus, zealots, and tax collectors. And frankly, I can't wait to see what this teacher and scholar and preacher will proclaim in our midst today. For I think she reminds us all of why Bible study, when undertaken at an open table, can be ever exciting and new. Will you join me in welcoming back to the podium Dr. Benita Wings? Well, this is the last of the three lectures. I did not think that I would survive them, <laughs> but I will live to tell it. And certainly I am once more grateful to all those who are responsible for my being here and for the wonderful lunch that I was a part of earlier today with the faculty and the raucous conversation that had nothing to do with Jesus and God. <laughs> but everything to do with our broken humanity uh, there around the table at the dean's home with his wife. And I want to thank them and my colleagues here and friends and those who I've not seen in a while and I'm reuniting. I don't know if Dwight Andrews is still here or not or if he's left, but I certainly want to uh, certainly let him know how much I appreciate him and Dr. Desiree there at Spelman and and so many others, and certainly my very good friend in crime, uh, Dr. Emily Towns, who, who is a, uh, a warrior in her own right and certainly walks like a lion. 
uh, all by herself. And so I am, uh, and I'm glad that you are doing right by her. She can always come on back home if you don't, if you don't do right by her. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Speak, Lord, in that way that makes preaching easy, teaching easy, in that way that makes hearing the preached and taught word a transforming experience. Speak. For your people here. Amen. I seem to be, without planning, I must say, I seem to be returning to the topic of what happens when traditions clash, when communities take up arms against each other and when nations go to war and when religions battle each other, even battling those within their religious tradition, all done in the name of God. I seem to be returning to that topic and it was not, I must admit, it was not deliberate or intentional on my part when your dean uh, contacted me months ago extending to me this invitation and as bureaucracies are, they want to know 10 months out what you shall talk about. <laughs> of course, you have not heard from God 10 months out. <laughs> but you must satisfy bureaucracies. And so I dashed off to uh, Yale the names of three texts in particular that, have, that are fond texts in my heart and certainly ones I have circled around before, though never really satisfied in the way that I landed. But bureaucracy wanted to know what would I talk about. And in my humanity, I sent three. And it was not until this week, certainly, that I began to see the connection between the three. And I'm not so sure if I want to say it, is, it was God who told me to tell the dean these three, or if it was that these are three topics, three uh, scriptures or uh, three stories at least uh, that probably are representative of all that I do in biblical study and as a preacher. I'm always somewhere around struggling with, raising questions with. I don't know if I necessarily knew that until, to, until this week, but uh, always interested in difference and diversity and disagreements in particular. I'm, I'm just fascinated with that. Perhaps, perhaps because I did grow up in a very difficult home where there was always disagreement. Perhaps also because I am, as I said to you the other day, I'm a recovering Pentecostal. And I grew up in a very, uh, I, I think, a delightfully contentious church where Sunday, if you know Pentecostal traditions, is particularly in that period of the storefront church in Atlanta, Georgia, where um, Sunday school often uh, spilled over, shall we say, into early morning service. And often because the pastor and someone there in the Sunday school class talking about Bible study were at war with each other. So what are you trying to say? Are you trying to say? So you so just how how did how did Jonah stay in that well all those years? And and, uh, uh, and why you at it? Uh, how many Marys are there in the Bible uh, anyway? And uh, so are you trying to say? And so I, as a little girl, while others were off in youth and children's Bible study, I was the little Sunday school secretary who sat right about over there and, and Sunday school class number one and number two, number three, number four would bring the Sunday school offerings. And so therefore I was privy to the theological debates of a Pentecostal church and its Bible study class. And so questions, railings, arguments, the story of faith, on one level, because at 11 or 11.15 or 11.29, we will begin worship. 
But all before then, we were arguing with each other. So I grew up with faith on the one hand and inquiry, heated inquiry on the other. And so on Monday of this week, it was a reading against the grain of Jeremiah to uncover the underside of an underground community of theologians nestled there in Jerusalem just beneath the radar who took exception to the dominant theology. Jeremiah and the Deuteronomic trustees of his book would later give, who would later give his book its final editorial flourishes, arguing for Yahweh as the one and only patron God of Israel, a God who was male, a God who was one, a God without female consort and without feminine association. Has a nation changed gods when they were not gods? Jeremiah says in 2.11. But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. And just on the other side of town, disappointed, distraught, and surrounded by the destruction of everything once precious to them as a result of the Babylonian invasion, headstrong women theologians of Judah emerged from hiding openly officiated over their priestly rituals and counted that no disrespect to Yahweh intended, but monotheism is inadequate, not complex enough that it ignores the experience and questions that women, especially women living in vulnerable situations, have and does not do justice to the fullness of humanity. It, if history as I said on Monday, is the final arbitrator of who was right or who is right and who is wrong or who has the most power to enforce their views of what's right and what's wrong. Then the women of Jeremiah 44 lost. The queen of heaven was lost to us. Reminding me of an African proverb, until the lion learns how to write, the tale of the hunt will always be told from the point of view of the hunter. The conclusion of that was that the bloody, bitter, bruising battle for God we've witnessed throughout history oftentimes has nothing to do with God. It is almost always a battle for power, for domination, and for the right to rule and to impose one's viewpoints on the rest of the world. Yes, Monday was about the battle, a theological battle between men and women, a theological battle between different theologians. And yet at the same time, it, is a, it, was, it proved to be for me a, an eye-opening battle why? Because it reminds me of even a battle that we're having or that we're in the midst of right now in America. A battle that just the other day, a certain denomination changed its theology about women. That women, women cannot pastor, but they can be vice president. How smoothly and quickly the dominant theology changed. <laughs> and how quickly it came to its conclusion and published its broadside. And I tell you that they never should have done it because it cracked a window that I hope certainly Baptist women, if not all women, did not, I hope that they recognize and take advantage of that little crack in the window when we watch und under our watch theology change for the sake of politics in our lifetimes. And it may just be God that gives us this opportunity to take advantage in a raw bit of power to justify their support of a particular candidate 
and his selection of a VP candidate, how through acts of selective exegesis, <laughs> a woman pastor, no, a woman vice president, yes. They should never have opened that door. <laughs> ah, the women baking cakes to the queen of heaven have a chance to change history. And then on yesterday, the story of David and Jonathan, it's the story of what happens when familiar covenant clash with social covenant, when families are threatened with internal strife, when the dreams of a father clash with the vision his son has, and when mothers and daughters scream at each other from across the table, when the younger generation repudiates the generation that came before it and all of its values. It is also the story of when one generation votes for change and another generation votes for certainty. It's also, Jonathan and David, the story of a king who remembers the sacrifices of friends, kinspeople, and ancestors, and even his own enemies. It is the story of a king who looked into the eye of his enemies, grandchild, and recognized the face of his dearest friend. And today, we take, for me as certainly a scholar of Hebrew Bible, that quantum leap to that other testament. A quantum leap historically, a quantum leap culturally, canonically, theologically, and yes, even politically through the annals of history into a different testament with his own cast of characters, his own religious battles, his own sociocultural framework, his own geopolitical context, and his own ways of seeing the world and doing things. I tell you, we can learn a lot about church and church politics and church people by paying close attention to the configuration of personalities, Jesus surrounded himself with those precious few years of his ministry. And he was not just surrounded by these strange personalities known as his, his disciples. He called these personalities to follow him. It's one thing when they come. It's another thing when you told them to come. I tell you, take Peter, for example, who was quick-tempered and short-sighted. He was constantly making mistakes. Jesus, Judas, who later betrayed Jesus when the going got rough, they all abandoned, all of them abandoned Jesus and fled away into the darkness, leaving Jesus to, a, to die alone. And so some man, someone may ask, well, what does this tell us about Jesus? It tells us at least one thing, perhaps, Jesus was a lousy judge of character. <laughs> one disciple betrays him, another denies him, quick-tempered is another, or at least one of them. What would make someone willingly start a church with these kinds of people? Now, in the name of full disclosure, I should tell you that I must admit that, I, I, that, the, that the seeds for this message were planted over 20 years ago when I was a Ph.D. student and sat in a chapel service one day listening to a sermon by Reverend Dr. Marvin McMickle, who was at the time pastor of a Baptist church in Montclair, New Jersey, and a visiting professor of preaching at Princeton Seminary. And he started his sermon off with something like this. When we think of them, that is the disciples, we think of a group of fishermen who lived in the same region and shared the same lifestyle, looked out upon the world from the same perspective. But the fact is that the group assembled by Jesus was not a homogeneous unit that was similar in vocation or values or viewpoint. It was a group with wide diversity and at two points, that diversity was widely scandalous and startling. I tell you, audience, 
No, uh, how, how would uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe would have said that? I tell you, reader, there is a mystery to life itself. How listening to Marvin McMichael in 1984 give this sermon there in the chapel at Princeton, talking about the diversity, the difference in personality among the disciples, a light. Now, you may have heard this before, and it may mean nothing to you. It may not impact you at all. But for this ex-Pentecostal girl who saw the text all in as a kind of flatline experience, to hear this preacher get up and say, they were different. They were not all the same. It was like the combination of a lock. The tumblers clicked and fell into places. Hinges opened, and I never read the New Testament again the same. It's those times in life when things happen that give you just what you need at the moment that you need. Synchronicity. Epiphany. Whatever you call it. I like to call it, as they say, when the student is ready, the teacher will come. That moment when you began to see the diversity in scripture. Now, of course, I had already been familiar with that. I mean, J.E.D. and P, two creation story, the apocalyptic tradition, the Deuteronomic tradition, the wisdom tradition, the priestly tradition. I was already familiar with that. Di di difference, diverse opinions, different angles on the same story. But you see, that's the Hebrew Bible. Now we're talking about Jesus. See, that, you see that, uh, 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 you see, students will let you do anything with the Hebrew Bible. But don't play with their Jesus. <laughs> As I often said when I was a faculty member, this is a class, I, this is a class not on what God said. This is a class on what Israel said, God said. I do not know what God said. You have to go see the theologians to find out what God said. <laughs> All I know is what Israel said, God said. That we can study. But to return to the story of these disciples, for me, hearing Marvin McMichael that day talk about the difference in personality of these disciples reminded me, reminded me, and this little girl from this little church in Atlanta, Georgia, it reminded me of Deacon Foxworth. It reminded me of the, uh, of the various people in my church who were always contentious and disagreeing, and our beloved pastor, whom we all loved, but we were all so contentious, at least the adults were. And listening to Marvin McMichael talk about and that Jesus called to himself this radically different, diverse group of people and said, come and follow me. What a motley crew, rough and smelly fishermen, hardened laborers and tradesmen, revolutionaries and hotheads. Crooked accountants and cowardly lions. Not the sort of people you and I would pick out if we were to save the world. A motley crew, but Jesus picked them as his team. Bad judge of character, indeed, when he chose big mouth, hot head Peter. What was he thinking when he chose James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, who were quick to protect Jesus through their, though their zeal was misplaced, who, whose mother was even pushy. Now, that should have been a sign to him right there. <laughs> His, their mother was even pushy, trying to get Jesus to elevate her sons in his kingdom. What was Jesus thinking in selecting Matthew, the tax collector, a hated, despised profession, even today. <laughs> Financiers, I must say also in full disclosure that before I went into ministry, 
I really did work on Wall Street as a broker for Merrill Lynch. And I never made a dime. <laughs> In fact, I was about to be fired uh, when I heard my call from God. <laughs> Now, God, you have my attention. <laughs> I was an economics major from Wellesley College with Carolyn Shaw Bell. And I wanted to work on Wall Street because that's what women did back then, so particularly at that era at Wellesley. And fate would have it that eventually, over several years, I did not get it the first day when they came to the campus to do the interview. Merrill Lynch did. I did not get the job. I was totally devastated. God, why, et cetera, et cetera. I went on to become a public accountant with Coopers and Librand, Coopers and Librand back then. Then through a series of incidents, went on to become, uh, ultimately moved down to New York and became a stockbroker with Merrill Lynch. And I tell you, the second day of working there, I knew I had made a mistake. You know, sometimes God doesn't answer your prayers and God is doing you a favor. And I went on and within a year, because I had not sold one stock, <laughs> talked to my friends on the phone. I was 23 years old, acting like a 23-year-old. And I was about to be fired. And I heard about a school called Princeton Seminary. And I said, I believe God is calling me to the ministry. <laughs> but that roundabout journey is what I'm trying to put my finger on. That notion of being called even when you don't know that you're called. And even when you're called, you don't know what it means to be called. But you sense this something, this purposefulness being worked out in you. And sometimes you go because out of your own flesh, out of your own kind of sense of, well, this makes sense, and I want to be a writer, but I can't be a writer, so why don't I go over to Princeton? And I do religion, and I come from a Pentecostal church, and, and Princeton Seminary is looking for colored children, and I'm a colored child, so why don't I go over? <laughs> and while I am there, I do this little religion thing on the side, but I'm really going to work on my, on my novel. And so I went to Princeton, and I thought I would just kind of do this little uh, church religion, theology, Bible, ethics, pastoral care thing on the side because how hard can religion be? <laughs> Don't we all come to school thinking that? This, that not one of the first things we must say as Bible professors, this is not Wednesday night Bible study. But I did not know this, and once I got there, I found myself sliding the novel to the side and being arrested by something else with Bernhard Anderson, with other professors, but finding myself being arrested. Not that I necessarily knew what, where this was going, but I felt and I heard something larger than myself. That sense of, and he called them disciples tax collectors. And then he is a tax collector. Matthew, despised, greedy, who had a remarkable work incentive, tax collectors, that allowed them to keep for themselves any and all funds they raised above the amount they owed the Romans. It must have seemed strange to everyone when Jesus announced he was calling a tax collector to be one of his disciples. And then if, as if that was not enough, okay, Matthew, the tax collector, along with Peter and along with James and John, and, and Jesus really could have stopped and should have stopped right there, but he goes on to call Simon, the zealot, to work with alongside of Peter, Simon, revolutionary, Simon the radical, Simon who actively aligned himself with a group actively fighting for the violent overthrow of the Romans, Simon who would have hated Matthew as a sellout, who would have wanted to kill Matthew as a man who exploited his own people. That's what radicals 
And yet, and Jesus called him to and said, come and follow me. This radical revolutionary. It would be like calling, I don't know, someone from the Black Panther Party with someone from Jerry Falwell's church, <laughs> Osama bin Laden, and Karl Rove. <laughs> Come and follow me. You must be kidding. And yet, despite their, their wide differences and the devastating results of their ideologies, Jesus wanted both of them as followers. And there is no indication that Jesus tried to change them. There is no indication that he rebuked them for their positions. He just said, come and follow me. Let me say as an aside, something I was telling a group of young people the other day. I, there are days, and I, I thank Nora for that invitation because I think she set me up to make some of these kinds of comments. There, there are days when, as, as I remember my father used to say, when I think that I have lived a day too long. I, I just never thought that I would live long enough when liberal would be a bad word. I just, I never meant to live that long. When liberal, the, the most, the, the best impulses of this culture opened doors for me gave me an opportunity to stand here, gave me an opportunity to think and write and to be a, the best impulses, let's call them liberal impulses, particularly during a, an era in history. I never thought I would live long enough when liberal would be a reviled term. I've lived a day too long with all of with all of his problems with all of it, 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 liberalism it, the liber, the word the people the movement the era was not perfect but i never thought that i would live long enough to see a day when liberals would go in hiding when we now have to find a new word and call ourselves progressives and Jesus said you come and follow me these do two disciples Matthew the tax collector Simon the zealot represented both ends of the political spectrum of the day Jesus would not stay simply with Peter Andrew James and John it would have been easier for everyone if sameness and uniformity of opinion was the first requirement. But apparently, those requirements were tossed aside for the sake of including Matthew and Simon the Zealot. Jesus was out to make a point, not only about who he wanted to be associated with, but also he wanted to make the point that we are to work together despite our very real differences. Yes, 11 o'clock remains the most segregated hour in America, and it still does. But how different would the church look today if we, if we realized that Jesus called the modern equivalent of the most right-wing Republican and the most left-wing Democrat to come together and to be his disciples. Find a way to work it out. As my mother would say with 
12 children in the house. I don't want to hear your differences of opinion. I don't care who doesn't like this and who doesn't like that. Just don't burn down my house. But work it out and come back to me when you found a solution. And he called them disciples. John the mystic, Peter the impulsive, Andrew the missionary, Matthew the tax collector, Philip the evangelist, Nathaniel the bigot, Thomas the cautious doubting one, Judas the traitor, Simon the zealot, and he called them and put the ecclesia in their hands. And according to Luke, the eighth chapter, he went about preaching and teaching the good news of the kingdom of God, along with his disciples and certain women who followed at the risk of being overlooked by history. They are not mentioned in the text as the disciples, but they were followers. And if I may add, oh, how history would have been different if Peter and the disciples had had the good sense enough, had had the courage to replace Judas with Mary Magdalene. She was the only qualified candidate. <laughs> All you had to do was have witnessed Jesus and to have been with Jesus. And whoever the two that they cast lots for and eventually chose, we never heard from again in history. Because sometimes the best man for the job is a woman. <laughs> I am a child of the American South, where slavery and Jim Crow were norm, and the church and the Bible and Protestant Christianity were permanent fixtures of the soul. And I came to consciousness during the height of the civil rights era, the anti-Vietnam and the women's movement. I understand firsthand what the Jewish Feminist poet Andrean Rich means when she says, when she talks about being born and raised Jewish in post-World War II America by secular Jewish parents, she described herself as split at the root. I am North American. I am an African American. And I'm a woman. I'm a, both the product of a dominant culture and a victim of that culture. Split at the root. I'm a first world woman with third world commitments. I'm a woman raised in a patriarchal culture, but I am also a Western woman who, was, who has profited from my country's exploitation of the labors of women living in less developed countries. Multiple identities inform my reading of the Gospels, of Jeremiah, of any other text I may look at in Samuel and elsewhere. I'm a descendant of African slaves, a woman, a daughter of the American South, an ordained minister in the Protestant tradition, a mother and a wife. Mine is a context which has taught that texts are simultaneously to be submitted to and struggled against. That is the context of my call. And he called them disciples. That act of being called by Jesus to be both a victim of your context and to also triumph over your context. To be shaped and informed by your context, but to be able to stand outside and critique your context, to bless your context. And thank God for 
having a context, but at the same time to be able to open the door and increase the length of the table so that others from other contexts may have a place around the table. And he called them disciples. This notion of being called to something. Students often ask me about the notion of call and when I knew it and how I knew it. And God knows I am from the Pentecostal tradition where, where call is supposed to be unequivocal. You're supposed to be able to say, I know the moment, the hour I was called. My dungeon shook and my chains fell off. And, and I, we have this little song in the Pentecostal tradition. I wish you could have been there when I came through. The church was on fire with the Holy Ghost too. The Lord put clapping in my hands, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, in the Pentecostal tradition, you're supposed to be able to name the day, the hour. I, this is not a Presbyterian or, 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 uh, tradition. This is not a Episcopalian tradition. God is imminent. God is there. Jesus speaks, touches you, feel. And yet, I was this little Pentecostal girl who never had that experience. I never, I never heard. I never felt. I said yes to something. And to this day, I'm not quite sure. But I believe, as Zorin Kierkegaard said, life is lived going forward. But it is only understood by looking back. So when students ask me, as a professor, do you think I should go for my PhD? That depends. On what? It depends upon whether you love footnotes. <laughs> you are on the scent of your calling. If you don't read the text, you read the footnotes, the annotated bibliography, the sources of the book, and not just the book. Scholars love footnotes. As a writer, well, I would like to be a writer. Do you think that I could be a writer? It depends on what you must love sentences. Toni Morrison does that for me. I read a sentence by Toni Morrison and I grieve that I did not write that <laughs> sentence. You, you cannot write until you hear the right sentence. A writer is someone who loves sentences. It depends. Do you think I'm called to ministry? It depends on whether you can live with the silence of God. We must get up and preach as though we heard from God. But the truth of the matter is we have not heard from God in seven years. But when we did hear, the sound of God's voice was so sweet that the birds hushed their singing. And it is worth waiting another seven years. No one tells you this when you are called to be a disciple, a called to be, not just to do. Whether I ever teach again at a university, I am a teacher. Not because I taught at Vanderbilt that I was a teacher. I was a teacher and I happened to be employed at Vanderbilt. We are called to be not just to do. And some people will know what they're called to do as child prodigies. The rest of us will bumble our way through it all. And we are late bloomers and we come to it late. But you discover like Matthew the tax collector and Simon 
the zealot that all things come together. I did not start off a professor. I started off working at Dairy Queen, <laughs> making pineapple sundaes. And the day the two men came in and robbed us, and I was 14 or 15 years old, put us back into the freezer, I learned something that day <laughs> that, bo that, that, that helped me as a professor. Pay attention. Study people's behavior. I wish that I had not experienced a robbery, but it did alert something in me that would become important to my calling. That experience taught me something. All things work together. I did not mean to become a professor. I meant to become a pastor, but I was a member of a Methodist tradition in the 80s, or early 80s. Now it's more progressive, but back then I would have gotten a church with five members and four of them would have been over 90. <laughs> and so I decided that I did not want to pastor five members as a woman somewhere out in the sticks of New Jersey. I decided that if I could not become a pastor, then I would teach pastors. If the church would not change, I would teach change in the church, in my arrogance. But all the while, there was a God who takes us in our arrogance, in our zealotry, in our greed. And there's a hand behind all of it, moving for God's larger purposes. And I decided I would be a professor and I decided I would contest Method, the AME church at that time, but all the while God was doing something larger. Out of my own brute anger, God was shaping and calling me to be a disciple. Well, I tell you, and he called them disciples. And what happens when the disciple is like myself? When, Nora, you have more years behind you than you have ahead of you. And it is time not not to teach, but to teach and preach differently. You are not... It, the midlife crisis of vocation and calling is not about so much that you want to leave it, but you want to do it differently. You don't want to do it at 50 the way you did it at 20. That I thought by now phase. And so finally, and he called them disciples. About a year ago, I and my daughter went over to Fisk University to listen to a panel of those now 60-year-olds who had, in 1961, been around 18, 19, or 20 years old, or somewhere thereabout, the freedom fighters of Nashville. C.T. Vivian, John Lewis, Bernadette Lafayette, Diane Nash, James Lawson, but it was the one white male who had been from Wisconsin and told the story of how he came from Wisconsin down to Fisk on a lark to become an exchange student and how he got down there and it changed his world. His name was Jim, is, is Jim Zwerg. And he said, becoming a part of that movement with all of his violence as an 18 or a 19 or 20 or 21 year old man, he said, I never felt more alive than I did those years that I was putting my life 
on the line for this movement. And listening and saying to myself, now that is what it means to be called to something. Where he said, I've never felt more alive. I'm now 60, 61. He says, but when I was a boy, I had a chance to feel called to something larger than myself. That is what it means to be called to be a disciple. And so the story ends. One disciple by the name of Peter denies Jesus. Another disciple by the name of Judas would betray Jesus. But one would kill himself and the other would go on to a promising ministry. What did one disciple know that the other disciple did not know? Both called, both abandoned him, but one would take his life and the other would go on to have a wonderful ministry. Could it be that Judas left the communion table before he could hear Jesus say, Simon, Simon, the devil desires to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. Never leave before the benediction. <laughs> the preacher may just say something that saves your life. And now as I look out at us, some from Saul's generation and some of us are from Jonathan's generation, but all of us are here together remembering and thinking about and reflecting on what it means to be called a disciple. And as I stand here in the midst with one foot in one generation and perhaps another in another generation, I am reminded of a song that I keep on my iPod. Could it be that we were all, it was all so simple then? Or as time we written every line? And if we had the chance to do it all again, would we, could we, memories, amen.